Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on gaining acceptance in next generation PBK modeling approaches for regulatory assessments, where we'll explore together some case studies. So this webinar is organized by the OCD Environment Health and Safety Division of the Environment Directorate. I am uh, Magda Sahana, I'm administrator to the Chemical Safety uh, Program. So before we go further, let me emphasize that your active participation is important and is encouraged throughout the session. So during the presentations, we'll be managing the Q&A function found in the lower banner. You can enter your questions and comments in this Q&A box uh, during or after its presentation. And also you can indicate if you want to address uh, your question to a specific panelist. We will provide answers during the Q&A session that is scheduled at the end of the webinar. And in case that we won't uh, manage to address them all, we will be able to follow up with you after the webinar. So please use the chat function only if you have any technical issues and not to submit questions. As you have noticed, the webinar is recorded and it will be made available together with the slides on our web page. Today's webinar is on case studies using the PBK assessment framework that was developed and published last year by the OECD under this guidance document on the characterization, validation and the reporting of PBK models for regulatory purposes. Around uh, that time, we had uh, also an introductory webinar where we presented uh, the actual assessment framework and also had an extensive discussion on sensitivity analysis. So join me welcoming one of the main authors of this guidance document who co-led also the project within the OECD, Cecilia Tan uh, from the US Environmental Protection Agency. Cecilia is a senior scientist uh, at uh, the Office of Pesticides Program, and she's a PBK modeler, reviewer, and risk assessor. She will provide a short introduction to the guidance to remind us what is in there. After this, we'll hear about reporting and evaluation of PBK models from Betty Mick from the University of Ottawa, where she works on areas of development of risk assessment methodologies. Betty previously managed several chemical risk assessment programs at Health Canada. Following that, Jean-Louis Dorn from European Food Safety Authority will present a case study that was developed from EFSA, where we'll see how the reporting templates that, are, that can be found in the OECD guidance were used. And uh, we'll close this uh, first part with uh, Xiao Ching uh, Chang from Innotiv, who will present one more case study that was developed from the US National Toxicology Program. Xiao Ching is a senior computational toxicologist supporting the NTP Interagency Center for the Evaluation of Alternative Toxicological Methods, NICITAM, since 2012. In uh, part two, we prepared a, a role play to highlight some of the key messages uh, for the guidance. Uh, from one side, we will have uh, Cecilia Tan and Betty Mick in the role of regulators, whereas from the other side, we'll have uh, Jean-Louis Dor and uh, Xiao Ching uh, Chang uh, uh, in the role of uh, model modelers. And uh, we'll end the webinar with the Q&A session that uh, Alicia Painik kindly offered to moderate. 
Uh, Alicia was leading for the European Commission uh, Joint Research Center, the drafting of the OECD uh, guidance document uh, together with uh, Cecilia Tan. And uh, since October of last year, she joined uh, S Labs, a CRO that provides consultancy for PBK modeling. So with that, uh, I think it's time to move to the actual presentations and uh, give the floor to Cecilia Tan. So Cecilia, it's over to you now. Thank you, Mecca. Welcome everyone. Um, it is a great privilege to be here today and present to you this second webinar on the OECD PBK guidance. Um, Today, we will focus mainly on model submission and review or evaluation of the model. Okay, next. In the next slide, please. Um, in the next few minutes, I will cover the purpose and scope of this guidance document, compare this one with the existing um, documents, and then give you an overview of the content uh, for the new OECD PVK guidance. Uh, next, please. So we'll start with purpose and scope next. The purpose of this guidance document is to provide um, some um, guidance on char char characterizing, reporting, and evaluating PBK models that are developed uh, without the use of any in vivo data. In this document, we try to address some of the key challenges associated with developing and evaluating this type of model. And the ultimate goal is to promote the use of PVK models in regulatory risk assessment, especially in cases where in vivo data are lacking, and also to facilitate dialogues between model developers and the users. Uh, next slide, please. So the scope of, of this document covers the contextual information of the process for characterizing and validating a PBK models, but it is not going to go into technical details on the model development or applications. This guidance does not assign any confidence level to a model or a specific type of application because the confidence level should be depend on the context of use. This document is applicable to most chemicals or um, end species, as long as there are models to parameterize a model. And uh, finally, we believe that this guidance is a living document. Um, it is expected to be updated when we have more experiences and also when new technologies emerge. Next slide, please. Next. Um, there are several existing PBK modeling uh, guidance documents. There's the WHO 2010, EFSA 2014, and US EPA 2006. All three of them require the use of in vivo data to evaluate model performance, which is the key or main difference between these existing guidance and the new OECD one. Uh, next, please. And our guidance include a reporting template, which we'll talk more later for model submission. Um, this template is very similar to the ones published by the um, EMA and then also US FDA. The purpose for a reporting template is to standardize the content and format of model reports so that regulatory review of PBK model submissions can be more efficient, more consistent, and then also timely. Next slide, please. Okay, so now let's um, go into um, the, the detail of the OECD guidance. There are five specific aims to provide a uh, modeling workflow focusing on using in vitro and in situ methods to generate model parameters provide a model assessment framework to evaluate model performance or um, confidence level, a reporting template, and a checklist for model evaluation. Next, please. 
There are three chapters in this guidance document. The first chapter is introduction. The second chapter is the modeling workflow and some common in vitro and in silico methods um, for generating model parameters. And the third chapter has um, a model assessment framework, reporting template, and then also a checklist for model evaluation. Um, there are several useful references and case studies in the annex. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is chapter two. This is the modeling uh, workflow. Um, it starts with uh, problem formulation, followed by model structure and in vitro or in silico methods to generate model parameters. Again, this is the one key difference between this guidance document and the existing ones. Um, and then uh, step four is computer implementation. Step five is the evaluation of model performance. This is another key differences um, between the current um, guidance and the existing ones. Um, when in vivo data are not available to test model performance, we have to rely on other methods to compare model uncertainties with the uncertainties associated with the alternatives. The last step is model reporting and dissemination. Next, please. And in chapter three, we have this assessment framework, and uh, this will be covered in more details in the next presentation. Uh, next, please. The reporting template we recommend starting with an executive summary that clearly articulate the model purpose and then um, talk about the details of the model and highlight the key uncertainties. Followed by model implementations, any peer review records, parameter tables, references, and any background information. You will see later in the case examples, in the two case examples, how the modelers use this template to report their analysis. Next, please. Okay, this is my last slide. In chapter three, we also have a checklist for the model users to evaluate a model. Uh, what I want to emphasize again is that this guidance does not have a um, weighing system to tell you which element is more important than the others. The weight assigned to each element, modeling element, should be determined based on the context of use. And now I'll hand it over to our next speaker, uh, Betty Meek, to uh, talk more about model assessment. Um, thanks very much, Cecilia. So I'm going to provide a little bit more on the reporting and evaluation of PDK models um, as outlined in the guidance. So uh, next slide, please. So again, um, Cecilia has presented uh, this framework. There's really two important elements. Uh, one is the context and implementation, which addresses aspects relevant to the intended application of the model and the extent of documentation, really falls within the purview of the regulatory risk assessment community. And the other is model uh, validity, which is the reliability of the uh, model, which really needs to be described by the model developer. So there's a number of tools, as Cecilia has indicated, the reporting template, the evaluation checklist. And these really are the kind of, um, the kind of tools for communication between uh, the regulatory risk assessment audience and the uh, model developers. So next slide, please. So again, uh, um, just uh, reemphasizing the um, objectives of the framework. Uh, it's really about, it, it, it's based on established principles to consider this question, and again, you'll hear this as a recurring theme, is there sufficient confidence in the scientific basis of a PBK model to support its use in a specific regulatory assessment? And as Cecilia has indicated, that's for models where animal data are lacking for calibration or validation. So um, that's really the unique aspect that this uh, guidance addresses. So the critical focus that is really 
on the choice of the non-animal methods used to parameterize the model and emphasizing in particular uh, the sensitivity analysis to determine the relative importance of the parameters uh, driving output, because that's going to be critical to considering confidence for application. So next slide, please. Again, so if we think about this context and implementation, um, it considers regulatory application and context of use, which together determine the degree of acceptable uncertainty for the intended application. And so that falls within the purview principally of the regulatory assessor. And the next slide, please. So um, we've indicated that regulation, regulatory applications vary considerably. Um, so again, that's why the intended application is rather critical. So increasingly, our regulatory mandates are requiring that we assess many more chemicals in more limited time frames with decreasing amounts of animal data. So we have to uh, assess these uh, chemicals more efficiently. We're doing a lot more priority setting and ranking for monitoring and testing and even for assessment. And even within um, uh, assessing hazard and risk, uh, we're really looking at a mainly tiered approaches for both testing and assessment, where the objective is really to be as efficient as possible and only to invest as many resources at, uh, as are necessary to um, set the chemicals aside from further considerations as non-priorities or to further focus our efforts in the context of risk management. So we conduct these preliminary assessments. Again, um, the degree of confidence um, can be less for those because um, they will go on to uh, further stages uh, at some point when they become priorities. Um, so that's a very different degree of confidence that we require than we do for full quantitative uh, hazard characterization and risk assessment, uh, which may impact on, uh, on risk management um, to decrease uh, risk to public health. So um, really important, again, to understand that the confidence in the uh, models can vary for these different applications. Next slide, please. And then if we think about the, the, the component on model validity, uh, we're really looking at the reliability of the model there. Um, we have five considerations listed, uh, only one of which requires in vivo data. So that's the goodness of fit and predictivity. If we don't have in vivo data to calibrate the models, we really need to be um, focusing on the other four and investing some effort in documenting those well, documenting and conducting those well. And again, so that really falls with under the purview of the modeler and requires very transparent reporting. Next slide, please. So again, coming back to the assessment framework, you can think of these two components, uh, one which addresses regulatory need, um, the other which uh, addresses the model validity. And so the framework really provides a kind of a roadmap uh, with the reporting template and evaluation checklist providing the, the tools for implementation. So the model reporting template captures the evidence in support of a PPP model for regulatory assessment. The checklist uh, provides the basis for evaluating confidence in the specific use of the model, again, which is context dependent. And so these functional components of the framework, the reporting template and the evaluation checklist, address elements of both, they'll fall under the purview of largely one, the, the regulatory risk assessment community or the modelers, but it's really, they're designed to kind of facilitate this communication. So the objective of the webinar today um, is really to illustrate some of that iterative dialogue that's essential for regulatory application of a PBK model uh, using the template and checklist. Next slide, please. So um, I'll, I'll present a little bit more in the reporting template, but again, I think probably I won't present a great deal because I think it's best illustrated uh, through the um, discussion on the case studies. Next slide. So the, the PBK model reporting template, it prescribes the nature of adequate documentation of the PBK model to support regulatory evaluation. So you can consider it to be similar to uh, the kind of harmonized reporting templates that have been developed largely by the regulatory community to describe toxicological studies to ensure that their description is adequate for, uh, for their purposes. 
But I think it serves a really important role as well in terms of increasing understanding of developers of aspects that are important for regulatory application. Um, and as Cecilia has indicated, it, it, it increases consistency in descriptions and particularly efficiency of review of the model. Um, so it really facilitates the review by assessors. They know exactly where to go to find the information that they're looking for for their specific context. And um, that contributes to efficiency uh, of review of the model. So um, next slide, please. So again, I, I, again, in terms of the template sections, I just wanted to highlight a couple of aspects here that I think are important for consideration. So what I blue highlighted here are these aspects of the template that address um, kind of uh, those uh, considerations that are important for regulatory application. And um, so, for example, in the summary, as Cecilia's pointed out, um, there is um, part of that that deals with regulatory uh, applicability. And that's really, again, um, to facilitate um, this early discussion between developers and the risk assessment community uh, who might potentially use the model uh, in terms of tailoring the model to the need. Um, but also, in terms of describing a model, the extent of peer engagement in its development um, is going to be important as well, um, beyond just publication in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. And in terms of um, those aspects that are really important to the regulatory community, uh, the description of model characterization and identification of uncertainties are, are rather critical. So next slide, please. So again, uh, for model conceptualization, we're looking for descriptions of the model structure and mathematical represent representation, uh, the model parameterization, the es parameter estimation and analysis. And then for model performance, which is, which is rather important in terms of um, uh, particularly where we don't have in vivo data to calibrate the models. So um, the sensitivity analysis becomes um, rather critically important where we can estimate um, uncertainty in the output of the model uh, based on a plausible uh, uh, kind of structure for the model and plausible estimates of the, um, of the input parameters. So that's particularly important for um, models in which we're dependent largely upon in silico and in vitro data for parameterization. And for predictive performance, where there are no in vivo data for the chemical of interest, we're interested in analogs. Um, but it's important to very clearly justify um, how the analogs have been chosen or other sources of data, um, for example, and other aspects of, is there a reliable estimate of the dose metric for the analog? Um, is there, uh, can you characterize the biological variability of the in vivo reference data for the analog? So moving on to the next slide, please. Um, and again, I'll briefly address some aspects of the uh, checklist for evaluation. And of course, there is a relationship uh, between the modeling template and the checklist for evaluation. Uh, the questions that are included in the checklist have cued um, uh, the kind of content of the reporting template uh, or the descriptions of the models to facilitate um, evaluation by the regulatory community. Next slide, please. So the checklist for evaluation of model applicability, again, it really includes questions for the regulatory assessor to consider whether the evidence supporting the PBK model is sufficient for its intended application. Um, and as for the framework, of course, it addresses similar elements. It takes into, context, into account the context and implementation and the assessment of model validity. And next slide. Um, and I wanted to um, kind of focus on a couple of aspects here, which I think where I think transparency from the regulatory community can really help um, facilitate uh, this kind of uh, dialogue between, um, between regulators and uh, model developers. So um, to very clearly kind of um, determine whether in fact the acceptable degree of confidence for the envisaged application is met by the um, developed model. And so I think we're going to have to become increasingly transparent in um, the regulatory community about what degrees of uncertainty are acceptable for various applications. But again, um, we really need to be considering whether the degree of confidence or uncertainty is greater or less than that for the non-modeling option. 
And we're not challenged to do that uh, very much um, in regulatory um, science, uh, because it's important to bear in mind that the non-modeling or default options often take into account much less chemical specific, physiological and biological information. And in some cases, there are no alternatives for uh, data poor chemicals where uh, you may only have, for example, in vitro data, you may have no in vivo data, you're going to have to translate the doses in vitro to um, those in vivo uh, for comparison with human exposure estimates. So um, we really need to be considering um, what's the alternative. If the alternative is do nothing, we need to be characterizing the uncertainty, uh, refining as we go, um, but, um, but trying to make some progress. Another area I think is really important, and this has been very clear based on previous uh, regulatory experience, that having the um, um, kind of regulatory community, this dialogue between the modelers and the risk assessors in terms of if the uh, model doesn't meet the bar, um, if it's not accepted for a particular uh, regulatory application, what are the recommendations for refinement? And there's many examples of where that iterative dialogue has led to, um, in fact, uh, successful adoption of PVP models in, uh, in risk assessment. So uh, next slide, please. So again, uh, just a few important parts of this um, uh, in terms of context implementation. Again, the, the um, the uh, regulatory community is really going to be looking at uh, peer engagement uh, or has the model been used for uh, a regulatory purpose previously and, and the bar is a bit higher if it hasn't um, and they'll be considering whether additional review is required. And um, next slide, please. And in terms of assessment of uh, model uh, validity, again, I'm just gonna focus on really important aspects here. Uh, the reliability of the input parameters has the uncertainty of the parameters been characterized. And in relation to uncertainty and sensitivity analysis, has the impact of parameter uncertainty been estimated? And really critical is whether we're, or not we're confident in the influential parameter values. And that's important in this discussion um, between model developers and the regulatory community to focus the regulatory community on those parameters that are most influential. And uh, that's really where we want to have greatest confidence in the, um, uh, in, uh, the model development. So to the extent possible, we want to have um, um, very good data for that. And uh, next slide, please. And this is my final slide, which really relates to a confidence matrix, which is another of the tools that was provided in the guidance to, um, to cue really the risk assessment community to be thinking about how they're judging uh, the relative confidence they have in a model for regulatory application. And again, that's going to vary considerably from, for example, the priority setting where uh, low confidence may be sufficient uh, to uh, kind of quantitative, full quantitative hazard and risk characterization where you're looking for a very high degree of confidence and the kinds of elements we need to be looking at um, to uh, consider that. Um, what we call kind of these metrics to, to consider that. Um, so for example, the biological, what's the biological basis of the model? Do you have um, uh, data on for model simulations for an analog? Um, and then the uncertainty and sensitivity in particular, what's your confidence in the uh, critical parameters driving the output of the model? So that's, that's it. So I will thank you for your attention and pass it along to jean louis Dorn, who's going to present the first of the case studies. Thank you very much, Betty. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and I'd like to thank Magda and the OECD, also the two chairs of, of the guidance document group, so Alicia Penny and Cecilia Tan, for inviting me. So today I'm going to give you an example of applications of such PVK models focused on farm animals uh, through the EFSA case study. Next slide, please. So just to remind you, uh, this is the, the guidance itself, the OECD guidance, where we're looking at, again, the characterization validation of, uh, of the PVK models for regulatory purposes. And just to illustrate, there are a number of annexes in this guidance uh, attached to this guidance document, 
and we have put three EFSA case studies on the development of generic PDK models for humans, farm animals, but also for fish. Next slide, please. So as Betty illustrated very well, the, the guidance contains a reporting template and a tool to look at how confident we are in the PBK model we are looking at. So I won't go into details, but this is just to illustrate to then take that in. Next slide, please. Again, as Cecilia has highlighted, we have a number of modeling steps, the model purpose, the model conceptualization, the parameters, the computation. And of course, for regulatory applications, we're interested in the model performance, its validation, particularly sensitivity, variability, and uncertainty and analysis, and of course, the predictive capacity of the, of the model, and of course, reporting and publications. Next slide, please. So we took a number of steps to develop generic PVK models in farm animals, and I just wanted to highlight those steps to you. The first thing we would do if we are interested in a particular species, we need to collect the physiological data for that particular species associated with a number of biochemical parameters. And here, of course, we're looking at farm animals. Thinking already about case studies, we may want to collect chemical specific parameters, including physical chemical properties, TK parameters, blood concentration or concentration in various target organs or biological matrices. The, from the data collection, we integrate the model into a, an algorithm, which is basically the backbone of the model. So it becomes a physiologically based model. And importantly, we want to harmonize the sensitivity, the variability, and the uncertainty analysis as highlighted in the OECD guidance. To apply this model, we develop a number of case studies. And of course, we have the guidance documents here. And ideally, here in the, that's the case for the farm animals, we need to compare available published data and predicted values. So here, the assumption is that we have some in vivo data, some measurements that we can compare with the outputs of the modeling. If we take that a step further, we may want to develop an open source platform so that these models can be implemented and basically they can be used for, for these regulatory purposes. For example, we can predict kinetic properties and at some point integrate the toxicokinetic dimension in the risk assessment process. Next slide, please. So here you have an example of the generic PBK models for the farm animals. So the part one is the, P the PBK model reporting template, where you can see that you will have the name of the model, the contact details of the developer for peer engagement, summary of the model characterization, development, validation, and potential applicability, the model characterization, of course, a discussion on identifying the uncertainties, the model implementation details, peer engagement, and the parameter tables. So here I've just highlighted three key aspects. This is the model structure in figure one that you can see in this kind of slightly right-hand side of the screen. The comparison between predicted values and published values for a range of species, uh, namely swine, sheep, cattle, and chicken. And underneath, at the bottom of the slide, you have a global sensitivity analysis, which aims to take all the variables of the model together and try to basically identify which variables may in impact on the model. And here, I think this is the chicken model. You can see that body weight or fraction of the cardiovascular output of the kidney uh, are important, and as well as cardiac output. So this global sensitivity analysis allows you to quantify the relative contribution of a variable of a model to the overall variance of that model. Next slide, please. So if we take part two of, of the guidance, we have the chest checklist for model evaluation. I, I, I realize that this is very difficult to read, but this is just to highlight how we've taken those models and implemented them in, into the the checklist of the, of the OECD guidance. 
So again, you have the name of the model, you have context implementation, what is the regulatory purpose, A1, documentation, the software implementation and verification, the peer engagement, and then part B, the assessment of the model val val validity. You have the biological basis for so model structure and development, the theoretical basis of the model equations, the reliability of the input parameters, the uncertainty and sensitivity analysis, and of course, the good net of fit and predictability. And predictivity. Next slide, please. So here we have another example. Uh, Cecilia mentioned the WHO guidance document criteria with the uh, WHO criteria published in 2010. And this was uh, for the publication of this chicken model. And here you see that a very similar criteria, maybe less detailed than the OECD guidance, but you can see that you have the scope and the purpose of the model, the model structure and the mathematical description, the compu computer implementation, parameter estimation and analysis, model calibration and validation, and again, the model documentation. So this is just to illustrate to you um, another example from the, from the literature. Next slide, please. So part three, as highlighted uh, by Betty earlier on, when we're looking at the overall evaluation and looking at what are we confident in this model, here we've summarized the, the aspects for the, these aspects for the farm animal models. So we are quite confident in the biological basis of the model, since the model parameters and structure have a good biological basis. We have physiological data for all the species. They're consistent with the available kinetic data in several experiments using a single set of input parameters. Of course, here the model has been validated for a number of substances, so we are fairly confident. Model simulations and data uh, predictivity. Again, it, reprodu it reproduces consistently all the kinetic data, including the shape of time cost profiles for the chemicals of interest. And here we've been looking at prediction of target talking concentration and blood con plasma concentration of chemicals. We have used the global sensitivity analysis to support the robustness of the model. And these global sensitivity analysis have been run for each of the species since maybe for a cattle or for a chicken or for a sheep or a swine, the variables that influence the model may be slightly different. Next slide, please. So again, this is to illustrate to you the, we take it a step further, trying to implement uh, these such models into a platform that would be useful to the scientific and regulatory community. So again, you have your physiological data, you have your chemical specific data. If we have a number of models for a number of species, we may be able to calculate internal dose, such as tissue residues, or we may be able to calculate exposure from internal dose, reverse dosimetry. We may be able to compare species specific kinetic parameters to look at interspecies differences, or if we have data for a range of human subpopulations, let's say children, neonates, and adults, we may look at human variability. And in the future, this may allow us to, to run some TKTD models, for example, to derive benchmark those limits on an internal basis, as opposed to on an external basis. And of course, we need to harmonize the sensitivity and the uncertainty analysis. Next slide, please. So this prototype is under construction. Uh, and here you have an example on how the prototype has been designed as a web-based open source tool for kinetic and dynamic modeling. And I think the next slide will show you a little bit the way the platform is working. So you have, of course, an input parameter, which, which, is, the, which is going to be chemical specific and based on exposure but also it allows you to choose the model you want to run, whether it's a farm animal model, a human model, or a test species model like rats or mice. Then the application are gonna give you some outputs, forward dosimetry, where you, for example, for the farm animals, we want to predict concentration in organs or kinetic parameters. Again, reverse dosimetry, you want to go back using, for example, biomonitoring data, 
predict exposure from internal dose. And we also are building some uh, models that have applications in the ecotoxicological area, such as dynamic energy budget models and toxicodynamic modules for benchmark dose modeling. From these simulations, you will then get an automated report that will summarize the output of, of the modeling you've asked for. Of course, in parallel, we have the possibility to, in, to run uh, sensitivity analysis in, in the tool for, for all the different models. Next slide, please. So here you just have a, sm a simple illustration on the forward dosimetry. Again, we're looking at farm animals. We're trying to predict concentrations in biological fluids or organs. And here you can compare the measured data with which, which are the little black triangles and then the simulated data, which, which is the, the black curve with the, the smooth, the link confidence interval, which is highlighted in gray. So you can simulate the model, as you can see, you can run a local sensitivity analysis, so-called Morris screening, or a global sensitivity analysis using, for example, Sobel plots or Lowry plots. And you can compare different simulations. If you're running the chicken model, you can then compare it with the swine model or the test species models or human models. Next slide, please. Here is an illustration on the, trying to predict uh, basically basic pharmacokinetic parameters such as AUC, Cmax, Half-Life, or Tmax. Next slide, please. I would like to thank all the colleagues uh, involved in this work, and you can see the list is rather long. It did take quite a, quite a long time to, to achieve where we are now, and without all these colleagues, this wouldn't have been possible. And with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and highlight to you the, the One Health Conference of EFSA, which will be run in Brussels between the 21st and the 24th of June 2022. And with that, I would like to give the floor to the next speaker, Xiaoyong Chang. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, here I'm going to talk about the second uh, um, case studies that I applied the HTTP models to relate in vitro assay data to the human exposure. Next slide. Next slide. Sorry. <laughs> this is just my disclaimer. Next slide. Uh, here, just to give some background information. So the organophosphor flame retardants um, had been in increasingly used to replace the brominated flame retardants. But there's, there's some uh, information on the toxicities of these chemicals are limited. And the concern has been raised regarding the developmental neurotoxicities of this set of the chemicals. So um, petition has been received by the CPSC about banning some, some of these flame retardant products. Be able, to be able to make the decision, the CPSC needs to conduct the higher assessment for these products. And these chemicals were nominated, nominated to the National Tax College Program, NTP, for testing based on the testing results. And, and I, I, I had a case study report uh, has been developed and included as a part of an OECD guidance document, which is under review. And the purpose of this case study is to show how the, the DNT battery can be used for prioritizations for further in vivo testing. Next slide. So now we have, so the DNT battery assays are actually a battery of cell-based in vitro assays. Now we have these assays, I mean, how to uh, put these assays into the uh, human exposure, like in vivo context. And um, this heat map basically show being the uh, benchmark concentration derived from uh, uh, the various assays along all these chemicals and also some in vivo neural behavior data were collected from literature when uh, it's available, and also some uh, human exposure 
information were collected for this set of the chemicals. Next slide. Okay, so now we have this in vitro assay data. We really need to uh, put them in the in vivo context. And uh, uh, so we there are several approaches you can use to uh, do this comparison. One way we choose to use is to uh, using the PPPK models to predict the plasma concentration from the, the, ex, the human exposure and then compared to the in vitro uh, activity concentration and to choose the models. And the features that we preferred is that they are open source, so they are transparent. And uh, because we, we are evaluating the a list of chemicals, so we prefer uh, to be high throughput also. Next slide. So just this table just give you an overview of the popular used uh, modeling tools. There are some uh, commercial tools and also some open source tools because we choose open source. So these are the two uh, choices that we uh, can make selection from. And uh, for this high soup toxicokinetic R package, because they are including the data for a few hundred environment chemicals, which is also uh, our study focused. So that's why we choose the HTTK R package our, as our platform to build a chemical specific PPPK models. Next slide. So some uh, uh, overview information of the HTTK R package. So this package has been built by a few, a group of scientists from the US EPA and they are open source, transparent, and the package has been peer reviewed in, and, and, and pub published. The primary goal of this package is to provide a human dose context for the in vitro bioactivity concentration. And the secondary goals is to provide open source data and tools so for people to evaluate and use by the broad scientific community. Next slide. Uh, to run the HTTP models, the input parameters are required. And in HTTP package, the experiment data for the fraction unbound and the intrinsic clearance are available for a few hundred chemicals. And for chemicals, there, there are no experiments available. The QSR model predictions for the input parameter are provided. And in addition, user can actually use their own parameter values to uh, run the model. And the, the package uh, make, make the user can run like multiple exposure rods and for the multiple species. A population simulator also including in the package so people can use it for evaluating the population uh, variability. The, the package allows both PPP PBK modeling and IVE, so covering both forward dosimetry and the reverse dosimetry. Next slide, please. So we were able to build a, a chemical specific PPK models using the HTTK package for all these 10 uh, flame retardants and were able to uh, predict plasma concentrations from either human exposure, which represented by the colored bar, or the in vivo data, uh, which represented by the uh, triangles, the open and the solid triangles. So the blue circle represents the lowest benchmark concentration from the, all the in vitro assays in the testing battery. So the, the red arrow pointed here indicates those chemicals where an overlap is observed between the solid bars and the blue circles, which suggests that this the human exposure might exert a developmental toxic, toxicities. And these chemicals would be uh, 
prioritized for the further in vivo testing. Next slide, please. Okay, so when reporting these models in our uh, uh, studies, uh, we were uh, suggested to use the OECD template. So, so next time I'm going to uh, share my experience with using the OECD template. Before getting to the template directly, I uh, would like to give you more detail about the HTC models I used in the study. So it is, as you can see, it's a very condensed form of a PBT models. And the rate change of the amount of chemicals is modeled as a mass balance differential equations. Constant partitioning is assumed uh, uh, between uh, tissues and the blood. And the clearance of the chemicals is mainly through the hepatic metabolism metabolism and also the renal excretion. Next slide, please. Okay, so here I'm just giving some details on the section A to C of the PPPK mod, uh, reporting template. So here I want to highlight is the section C, which is the summary of the model characteriz characterization and the regulated uh, applic applicabilities for um, this case is uh, to uh, the prioritizations for the further in vivo testing. Next slide, please. So section D is the model characterization. And this section actually is aligns well with the modeling workflow steps. So here is from the step one to six in the, the scope and the purpose of the model uh, and the model conceptualization in the um, basically the model structures and the, 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 the mathematic functions used and uh, the model per parameterization. And for the model, model parameterizations, um, like I pointed, uh, the HTTK package already contained the experimental value for a few hundred chemicals for the fraction bound and the clearance. So in our case, for these 10 chemicals, I developed the model for, uh, I used experimental uh, measurements for, a, for a, few them, of, a few of them, and the, but for the rest, I, I use the values predicted uh, by the HTTK. And the step four and step five. So highlight here is the model performance. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, in vivo data, uh, like in vivo pharmacokinetic data can available to uh, validate the model performance. But like Betty has pointed out, uh, in case of the liking of in vivo data, uh, certainly I can do the sensitivity analysis and to, to assess the model performance. So uh, I, I, I haven't done that, but the, it's, it's, it's doable. It's the, the, the platform I used would allow me to do the sensitive analysis and the model documentation. So the HTTP package itself, I mean, it's well documented. You can uh, access through the link here mm, from for the chemical specific models that I developed in the package, it will be documented uh, in the in other case studies. Next slide, please. So the section is identification of uncertainties, like by the point it out, is also very critical. And um, so, so we, I personally think the input parameters is actually where where the most uh, uncertainty probably will rely on. And uh, the in general, when the HTTP package uh, were development and the uncertainty on the, the measurements uh, for the fraction bound and the intrinsic clearance have been uh, well uh, analyzed and published. And also the method has been calibrated for the predicting the tissue plasma partition coefficients and also volume of distribution. In, in my specific 
the models development you this package. Uh, I haven't done the uncertainty analysis yet, but uh, uh, but it's it's still like doable. It's it's doable if I use uh, HTTP functions. And the model output in my case is the maximum plasma concentration, which is what I really uh, uh, would like to get. And uh, from the human exposure and the, the uncertainties for this output can be uh, evaluated uh, by adding the population variability, which, which also um, can be done using HTTP package. Other uncertainties that I can see is the conversion from the various exposure sources to the, the oral exposure um, dose metric, milligram per kilogram per day, because in this specific studies, I mean, the, there's a various source of exposure. For example, from breast milk, hand wipes, and the house dust, which are are very different. Like uh, when you consider the conversion from the from this ex different exposure source metric to the the our exposure unit used for running the models, some assumptions in are uh, assumed are uh, uh, used, which uh, which can bring a lot of uncertainties. Next slide, please. So this section F to I of the reporting template. So basically it's, uh, all this is more, uh, more like documentations of, I would highlight here the parameter tables. So using the HTTP package, the parameter values can be easily extracted. And then uh, we, we actually including this as a supplemental table um, for the I had studies in the OECD study report. Next slide, please. Okay, the take home message just share my experience of using the OECD reporting template. I found out it's very useful to facilitate the design execution and the evaluation of the model. So I, I, I done it after I have developed my model. So so actually, it will be much more useful if I understand the reporting template first and then build my model. So it will give a definitely a modeler um, fit for a consider more like giving more consideration of the fit for purpose of using the model of building before the building model, and uh, it also helped me to understand more about uh, you know the pros and cons for my model regarding the. The regulator acceptance and in the the model i'm so definitely to fill in all the informations in the reporting template will definitely help the reproducibility and the transport the transparency of the the modeling analysis and the results so i think this using this reporting template definitely help uh, promoting the regulate acceptance of a model, of a PPPK model. Next slide, please. Uh, I would like to thank for all the colleagues who have been involved in this work. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you everyone for uh, taking time to attending the webinar and we will answer all those questions. Thank you, Xiaoxing. Thank you for all the speakers. Um, so next, we are going to have a role play review to highlight some of the common questions that we have heard related to PBK models that are developed without the use of, developed or evaluated without the use of any in vivo data. And um, in this role play, um, myself and uh, Betty Meek will serve as the, the reviewers um, to review the two case studies submitted by um, Zhao Lu and Xiao Qing. So I would like to invite all the um, speakers 
um, to turn on your video now. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So in this first question, uh, maybe we can start with uh, Zhang Lu and Xiaoqing, you, you may uh, add uh, more after uh, Zhang Lu responded to this question. So for the modeling approach that uh, you submitted, what is the context in risk assessment? And do you see for your approach, there are other potential applications? And also in your experience, what are the common barriers that you see um, for the regulatory agencies to adopt your approach? And how would you recommend overcoming these barriers? So, Zhang Lu. Thank you, Cecilia. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So the context of the, of the modeling approach, well, the context in risk assessment is mostly, we're looking at feed additives. Uh, so assessing the fate of feed additives in farm animals, either for the animal health itself, or also the outcome could be used as an input for the human exposure assessment. For example, you have a hundred, you're looking at uh, prosciutto ham and uh, 100 gram consumption of prosciutto ham and you've calculated the residues for the swine meat in, in the muscle. That could be an example. When it comes to other potential applications, of course, this can be applied in, in EFSA's context. Which I can think of, of course, uh, so pesticides. We can think of contamin environmental contaminants mostly. I would say these would be the main applications. But again, they could be applied to any chemical that are regulated or contaminants. If we were to use not for the animal health dimension, but for the human health as, as input for human health. In terms of barriers, I would say that we may start to consider metabolites because here we're looking at parent compounds only. And, and also, uh, under, well, particularly to understand if the parent compound is the toxic moiety or if it's the metabolite who is the toxic moiety so that of course we can adapt then the, the model. Of course, this gets more complicated, but this is an old question. So I think this, will, this, this is something we're working on for the future. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Xiaolu. Xiaoqing, do you have anything to add? So yes, and like uh, the case study example I uh, talk about, we really use it for prioritization. I think that definitely um, approach that's, I would see, see it's very uh, feasible in the risk assessment. Um, and also for the potential regulator applications, uh, um, yeah, that's prioritization. That's what I see from the models I, I developed. And um, some of the common uh, barriers is the data availability and um, and the data sharing. I think uh, uh, the more data we have, I mean, the better model we can build. And, uh, and also, I think it's very important uh, for the regular the involvement of the regulatory community and uh, to the beginning like the early stage of building a model like uh, they actually can request in then talking to the modelers like what's their purpose i mean how like how what's the criteria how loose or how tight they they want the model uh, to be to be used for so the modeler can can whether can choose whether they they just using a high throughput modeling platform to build a, a quick model to give like to sweep information to get some information or they really need to consider all the details of the the chemicals uh, the structures and metabolites to to build a models uh, well built for one chemicals. So I, yeah, I would like the more involvement of the uh, risk uh, um, regulatory uh, regulatory uh, the community uh, for the modeling for the uh, yeah the design of the models. Thank you. Thank you. 
so next, um, Betty, would you like to uh, summarize and give us um, the risk assessor's uh, perspective? Right, so um, just a couple of things we've heard um, uh, and, and, and seen that um, some of the barriers include the perceptions of large uncertainty when in vivo data are lacking. And in part that I think relates to the fact that um, the bar is higher in the regulatory environment if you haven't gone down that path previously. Um, and uh, as Jean Luz indicated, the modeling approach often not considering metabolites. Um, and again, uh, I guess we really need to consider that uh, in the context of the specific application. Um, how much information are we bringing to bear in a priority setting context, for example? And I, I, I think we'd have to get more comfortable with um, using some of these models in that context um, to better evolve them, but also to get a feel for um, you know, relative confidence in what we're doing. So um, I think we've heard the models and applications should be designed with purpose for specific regulatory applications. And that discussion between the uh, modelers and the risk assessors is really important. And of course, um, in, in, in two of the case studies, it's really that we presented here today, that's really at the request of the regulatory community. So they, they really want these modeling efforts to inform uh, their decision making. So um, that's really ideal in terms of having that interface early on. So, and continuing the communications between modelers and the regulatory community. So having kind of pre-consultations with the regulatory community, but then Having discussion in terms of, again, if uh, the model isn't adequate for purposes uh, that, the, uh, that the regulatory community envisages, um, there really needs to be a discussion about how best to refine it to focus on their uh, priorities. Um, training for model users, I think, is a really important aspect as well. And um, uh, in regulatory agencies, um, there's going to have to be more familiarity with PBK modeling, but there's also an issue in terms of just access to PBK expertise. Um, uh, being a PBK model, you're, you're in demand you know? and there's, there's not huge numbers. So um, I think it has implications for um, training in that area generally. So. Thank you very much, Betty. Um, so for the next question, so Jean Lu, you mentioned that um, not considering metabolite is one of um, the common barriers for a regulatory agency to accept um, PVK modeling approach. So did you consider metabolites in your model? And um, if not, do you um, think it's a problem for people to use your modeling approach? Thank you, Cecilia. So as, as mentioned before, the current models are basically running the, the parent compound and, and the elimination of the parent compound. We are working on incorporating uh, information on, on, metab on metabolites and metabolism. So the farm animal example, of course, is comparing available in vivo data and trying to predict the, such in vivo data, which is kind of a slightly different application where you're using in vitro data. One of the issue is the in vitro assays are not available uh, let alone for humans, uh, even for farm animals. So th there's definitely a lot of developmental needs to be performed here to, to also look at metabolites in in vitro experiments and to start incorporating this type of information into the PEPK modeling. But we do need the in vitro assays to, to be able to handle that as much as the quantitative in vitro in vivo extrapolation as the next step. So I would say that's, that's, that's quite a barrier, but... Uh, well, hopefully, we'll, we'll try to overcome it in the future. Thank you Thank for your you question. So, Betty, what do you think? Yeah, I think there's particular cases where we know the parent compound is, um, is important. Uh, so, um, I mean, that's the type of thing we probably need to be capturing in the descriptions of uncertainty for the models. Um, and uh, there's very simple cases where the models are quite applicable. Um, and again, I think many of the concerns about the metabolites uh, really apply to um, traditional toxicity testing as well. We may or may not have the profile of metabolites. Um, uh, probably the limiting factor is um, 
the kind of bottleneck in identifying and measuring the metabolites, their characterization. So um, I think we always need to think about it in the context of, well, what's the model bring to the table and um, how do the uncertainties um, compare to those for uh, an alternative approach that we might use? And that, of course, um, is in the context of how you're going to apply the model. And of course, as Jean-Louis indicated, there's many ongoing research efforts to identify metabolites and bioactivities using in vitro and in silico methods. So hopefully we'll make progress on that soon, but there are some simple cases where the models are appropriate. <laughs> right, thank you, Betty. And we want to emphasize a lot of issues that we heard, it is not a new problem, and then it is also not a model specific problem. A lot of these issues go beyond um, um, PUK modeling. Okay, so for our next question, we'll give Zhang Lu a break. Uh, Xiaoqing, uh, I'm going to ask you this next question. So, um, can you compare the uncertainty or confidence level between your modeling approach, your high throughput modeling approach, with the alternative, for example, using the default? I, in this case, I'm not even sure what default approach uh, it will be. Um, I guess in your case, the alternative is to not use the model at all. Yes, that would be an alternative. So first I want to um, evaluate it to the uncertainty of the model I used. So, so basically, I mean, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty of, uh, like uh, uh, around the input parameter, like Frank Shangbaum, I mean, trees clearance. However, because the, the in, inside of the HTTP package, the, the fraction uh, uh, the fraction bound and the intrinsic clearance model, they were they were both built using a, like experimental data for a few hundred uh, um, chemicals. So so that's a, a valid uh, like QSA modeling and they are the valid QSA modeling approach. So by using this, that actually give uh, me uh, some confidence, like even I don't have experimental fraction bound data. I mean, by using um, a good fraction bound QSR models, you uh, use that predictions. I'm 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 confident that this values is 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 valid. And uh, another for the alternative way of using uh, instead of using the the predicted fraction bound and the clearance. I would think uh, uh, the model are actually using uh, like a assumption, assuming, assuming all the intrinsic clearance to like zero intrinsic clearance. Basically, you uh, assume that this chemical is inside your body. I mean, so that that way you will get a I would say a, a maximum C max. In that way, that's but that will be really most conservative. But I think it depends on the needs, and that could be a way the model I can use. And also, like, uh, so this approach is building mainly from in vitro data, but uh, we also know, like, the in vivo, there's a lot of variabilities and uncertainties regarding the in vivo data set. So, so the question is how to compare the variability around the in vitro data and those around the in vivo data. So uh, I would say that will be uh, um, some work to do in the future. I mean, to, to justify more, more the, the, the approaches that we are taking based on the in vitro data. Thank you, Xiaoqing. And Betty, you talk about this issue a lot in your presentation. Maybe you would like to reiterate the key points. Um, yeah, I think that, um, again, if we are prioritizing chemicals for testing um, and uh, we're really trying to bring the best data that we have to bear, um, it's the only data that we have, um, what's the alternative really? If we can't test all of the chemicals, uh, you know, the alternative is to do nothing and that's, um, that's not helpful. So again, in this particular case, uh, you know, the BBK model is essential to convert the in vitro doses to in vivo uh, concentrations. So 
Um, and again, uh, kind of really understanding uh, what's the objective of the regulatory community. It helps a great deal to have champions of these approaches in the regulatory community as well, who well understand um, the advantages of PBT modeling and uh, how, uh, how they can bring additional information to bear in terms of addressing their priorities. Thanks, Betty. Um, so the next question, maybe Xiaoqing, you can um, help answering. Um, so how do you evaluate um, your model uncertainty without the use of any in vivo data? And then um, I think this is a question that we've heard often. And then how do you, and then also related to your in vitro measured parameter values by like fraction unbound or um, uh, clearance, intrinsic clearance, how do you confirm that these in vitro measured parameters reflect in vivo conditions? Okay, so for the first questions, um, like I actually have pointed out in my case studies that because I don't have in vivo data, especially in vivo TK data to use to evaluate, to validate the predictions I had. Mm, however, um, uh, uh, one thing I could, uh, however, the one thing I could uh, think is like the, in the HTC package, there is a way for you to do the Monte Carlo simulations for the, the population variabilities. And also you can actually run a Monte Carlo simulations for the experiment for the for the fraction unbound and the intrinsic intrinsic clearance measurement uncertainty. So by so by running both Monte Carlo by running the Monte Carlo simulation for both both factors, that will actually cover some variabilities. Mm. And another way for evaluate model uncertainty is that uh, we can actually refer to uh, the earlier, like uh, the QSR modeling results uh, on the fraction bound and the intrinsic clearance, which the paper has been published to evaluate uncertainties. And also based on that, the, that's how the HTCK package uh, inside the HTTP because they have functions to evaluate. It just I I didn't have, have I didn't pre like uh, evaluate specific for these studies, but after using the reporting template, I know that's actually it's very critical. <laughs> and for the second questions, to confirm uh, in vitro method model parameters reflect the in vivo conditions, that actually has been done like uh, based on for example using the intrinsic clearance data and to do the uh, allometric skewings to, the, to predict the in vivo hepatic clearance. Mm, I think study has been done to actually evaluate the, the predictabilities. I, I think several people have done that. And also the, there's data and the results analysis done specific, specifically for the those clearance data uh, in the HTTP package, because because when they first uh, uh, take the the clearance data, which also measured in vitro, they they did allometric scaling to the in vivo, uh, and then they compared to the the in vivo data. So. Thank you, Xiaoxing. So it sounds like there are a lot of research effort going on to, um, to evaluate model uncertainty and then comparing in vitro and in vivo situations. And then um, as we move forward, we'll, we'll learn more and more about these case studies. And anything else to add, Betty? Um, no, just to, just to highlight the approach in the guidance, which really related to the um, using chemical analogs wherever you can. And Again, there has to be justification for why that that's relevant to your um, uh, to your particular PBK model. But um, I think that's important. Right, and I also want to um, 
highlight that um, the read across approach is discussed in the guidance document. So a lot of the things that we learned from existing, well, uh, existing data, um, we can potentially apply to chemicals that have no data. And then uh, in the guidance document, we also talk about read across approach. Um, so um, sensitivity analysis. So our next question is about sensitivity analysis. Um, so maybe John louis can help us answer this question. Um, what is, uh, because you mentioned that in your analysis, you did both, uh, you did the global sensitivity analysis. So what is the basis for you to choose this specific type of analysis? And then what did you learn from your uh, sensitivity analysis? What are the implications for risk assessment? Thank you, Cecilia. So, uh, so yeah, the, the platform we've developed is, is following the OECD guidance. Uh, basically, your local sensitivity analysis will basically work on one variable at the time. So change one variable at the time and look at the output. Whereas the global sensitivity analysis allows you to compare the relative contribution of each variable to the overall variance of the model. So to look at the interdependencies between the variables and how they impact the, the outcome. So I would say that potentially it's good to do both, but uh, I think from the guidance, there's a tendency to go more for the global sensitivity analysis. But still, this needs to be done on a species specific basis, because again, depending on the physiology, uh, you will have probably the different variables impacting different uh, different species in the first place. Of course, if the comp if we you have a compound specific model, it will be quite different to a generic model that you are applying to different compounds. So I think this also has to be taken into account. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, John Liu. Uh, Betty, would you like to um, talk more about sensitivity analysis? Yeah, just um, just briefly, I think it's a really important point of communication between the model developer and the risk assessment community because um, there is a tendency uh, of risk assessors who come from often um, in, vivo regular, in vivo toxicology background that uh, to look at all of the model parameters and, and really not to focus on those that are really critical to the, um, to the uncertainty in the output. So, um, and it seems really important um, for the developers to focus uh, a lot of attention on um, reducing the uncertainty of the influential model parameters, particularly in a case where uh, we haven't applied the models uh, previously in the uh, uh, in extrapolation from uh, in vitro data. Thanks, Betty. Um, so uh, one last question. Okay. So um, touching if you have some in vivo data and then um, for, for, chem for some of the chemicals, but not all, and uh, you're evaluating your model performance with those available data, what, what criteria do you usually use to determine goodness or fit? And um, also, when you're using the same modeling approach um, that you have tested with in vivo data and then apply it to make predictions for other chemicals that don't have in vivo data, how do you determine that your model is applicable? So um, in a way, this is a question about the domain of applicability. How do you determine that? Okay, for the first questions, I would think uh, the uh, if I have in vivo data, if we compare the predicted to the the matter data, I mean, I would think of uh, any uh, ratios uh, under like tenfold will be good, and under surf fade actually will be really good. And uh, for we use the same modeling approach to make predictions for other chemicals that do not have in vivo data. Definitely, I think the read course is a um, method approach that we need to consider here. And uh, especially when you, when you, we, yeah, read course approaches, that's what we uh, uh, would consider here. And, um, and also, um, 
So, and also I would add for one of my previous uh, uh, comments to previous questions. So this high soup TK methods is, uh, is kind of new here in the environment, like toxicity, uh, to toxicity field, but the, this method actually had been used in the uh, like clinical studies used to estimate the therapeutic dose and the, the predicted the concentration are actually uh, pretty good, like within tenfold for like one out of magnitude for compared to those measured values in clinical trials. So, so this high throughput uh, modeling approach has been used um, used uh, in in the clinical studies, and so we basically try to see whether we can also use this to in our toxicology field. And Jen Liu, I, I know that you have compared some of your model predictions to in vivo data. Would you like to add what criteria do you use? I think it's going to depend on the, the context of the assessment and also the data availability. Ideally, if you had a benchmark dose limit, it would be probably better than an OAL because depending on the dose spacing, the uncertainty in, in the OAL will be yeah, pretty much the dose spacing itself. And of course, the predictions of the PUPK model could be within those boundaries. So if, I think we need to contextualize this a little bit better and also stimulate the use of benchmark dose limit modeling to, to be able to put together the kinetics and the dynamics. Thank you, Jean Liu. Uh, I know that for people, it's not satisfying to say, okay, it's a uh, case by case. It depends on the context of use. But uh, in reality, that is uh, that is how uh, PVK modeling development and evaluation uh, work. So, um, Betty? Yeah, just um, I, I think we've had interesting previous discussions with the modelers on, uh, on this front. And uh, I recall when we were doing the uh, WHO guidance, we kind of were looking for to the modelers to tell us what they consider to be the relevant, you know, factor. Um, and um, they wouldn't, they were very reluctant to give us an idea. And um, eventually they said twofold. And we said, we think in tenfold factors. <laughs> so, you know, ten, we, we're thinking in orders of magnitude. So sometimes I think that, um, this discussion with the risk assessment community in terms of what they're expecting in terms of their content specific application, what else is available, uh, what other options do they have is really critical. So, Well, one thing I would like to add is like, uh, um, so for in vitro assays, when you use, I mean, various type of in vitro assays with different you know, molecular targets to uh, uh, testing a chemical, you could you could have a few hundred fold difference even between the sensitivities of the assays. Like uh, so, that's why we actually choosing the most sensitive sensitive assays out of the uh, all the assay battery as a point to be compared to. So that's actually. Yeah, that's actually related to what the the purpose the the regulator uh, the, the regulator is seeking to whether they, they really want the most sensitive points to be the the best the maximum protective or they want to like like have something approach to be like precisely predicted. Thank you. And um, that concludes our role play uh, review session. And then uh, these six, six questions are uh, some of the important ones or key ones that we um, selected from our uh, checklist. So next I'll hand it over to Alicia for the Q&A session. Yes, thank you very much, Cecilia. And thank you to all the panelists that have made Excellent presentation. And I also found this kind of dialogue that has been now tried to reproduce, created uh, like a role play interesting. Uh, and I hope it's also effective uh, for the participants to understand how uh, you could, you know, try to bridge 
the risk assessment community with the modelers in order you know to fine tune and makes uh, and make a, a good uh, you know overall model that can be applied uh, within one specific uh, um, um, aim with, with a specific aim. Um, so now I would like to open the Q&A box and see we have several questions that pop up. And I will start uh, uh, with the first one um, that I think is addressed uh, to Betty's presentation. Um, so would a lack of in vivo data increase predictions uncertainty to very high level? Could you talk more about level of uncertainties and practical applicability of the PBK models without in vivo data? Yeah, again, um, I really think it depends upon your application and um, whether you're setting priorities or whether you're looking at full kind of hazard characterization, how you're going to look at the use of um, in vitro versus in vivo data. But in terms of the um, uh, in vitro data, we, we kind of need to compare to the models we're using currently, the animal models that we're using, the default approaches, which are commonly um, if we don't have um, much available data uh, to drive more mode of action-based testings or, uh, or mode of action assessments, we're really looking at a kind of a, uh, just a, a no observed adverse effect level or benchmark dose or concentration if you have one divided by default uncertainty factors, these tenfold um, factors. Um, we probably need to recalibrate in the context of if we're using um, uh, in vitro data in human cells, um, a big part of the question is how do we extrapolate to humans? How will we uh, kind of consider that data? Um, and this, uh, you know, in, in vitro to in vivo um, kind, of, um, uh, kind of extrapolation, um, I think that's probably going to be kind of established by precedent. Um, and again, that depends very much on the application. So we tend to think of uncertainty in the context of comparative uncertainty based on what we've done previously. So we will have to consider the uncertainty in the context of uh, what we've been doing previously and uh, what additional information this brings to the fore. And um, again, these interspecies differences, are we getting a better handle on those with the interspecies or with the in vitro data? So as opposed to the uncertainties we're dealing with in animal studies. Thank you, Betty. So for you, um, uh, what would be the uh, level of uncertainty that could be acceptable? This is another question that came up. So should the example for this person was, should we use a, a, a uncertainty factor of 10, for instance? So how could we um, address this or how can we apply this or what? how can we choose? Right. So, um, yeah, I think that, um, so I think that uh, kind of regulatory risk assessment or hazard characterization is a bit like case law. So it's built on evolving experience. And we always compare the, um, you know, our characterization of uncertainty in, in relation to judging what's an acceptable degree of uncertainty to what we've done previously. So I think that's what we probably need to think of it in that context. And as we um, kind of accumulate more information, uh, more cases in where we've applied um, some of the PBK models, uh, extrapolations from in vitro data uh, to set priorities for testing, we'll get a comfort level with um, the nature of the data um, that informs that meaningfully. I mean, we still want reliability of the models, but uh, taking into context uh, the uh, kind of um, degree of uncertainty that we're prepared to accept, given that um, we may not have alternatives. I mean, that, that also needs to be taken into consideration. So I think it will take some time. Um, it always needs to be introduced in, into a context with which the regulatory community is familiar. Tenfold is they're very familiar with at the moment. Uh, so again, but we can't, I, I think what we can't do is multiply these conservatisms without taking into account that we've actually brought more data to bear on the outcome. Thank you very much. Um, the other panelists, sorry, if you have any I yeah, just, other comments. Just wanting to add, um, so this uncertainty related to PBK modeling without uh, any in vivo data, this is also true for the toxicity sake, well, in vitro toxicity testing, right? So if um, in the future, 
are maybe in some cases now regulatory agencies are using these in vitro tax data. Um, CBK modeling is just essential um, to convert that in vitro concentration to in vivo concentration. So yes, there is a lot of uncertainty, but um, if we are going to use these in vitro tools, um, we um, there, there, there's no other way. Okay, thank you, Cecilia. Uh, jean lu Chaoqing, you have, you want to add something? No, on this one, I will. Uh... Okay. Chaoqing? Uh, no, thanks. Okay, so I will go to the next question, which is actually more uh, uh, um, technical and uh, related to uh, EFSA. Uh, and it's uh, addressed probably to Jean Lu. Uh, what about the trace documentation as supported by the uh, Good Modeling Practice Guideline published by EFSA? And I think she's referring to EFSA 2014 uh, uh, um, guidance document. Uh, is there a link with your reporting template? So I think the the, the trace document is most well has mostly been applied to the ecotoxicological area. And I think the history of the OECD PBK, PBPK guidance or PBK guidance and the WHO guidance are in the human health area. There are lots of commonalities between the trace document and, our, and the reporting template here. And I think we ought to bridge these two at some point or find the commonalities or highlight the differences. This would be a very interesting exercise, especially when we're looking at PBK models or DEB models to be used in the ecotox area. So that would bridge the two disciplines. So I think there's a bit of work to do here. Yeah, exactly. There will be more work to be done uh, to bridge the communities. Yes. Um, next question uh, uh, that I would like to ask uh, uh, to Cecilia, which was a bit a kind of uh, um, maybe to define what is the community of regulators and what is the community of uh, uh, model developers. Maybe not everybody's acquainted with this type of terminology. What, are, what is a regulator and what is a modeler? <laughs> uh, I guess for model developers, are, I would call PVK modelers, um, those who collect their data and um, build PVK models for applications. And regulators are the users, uh, users who are interested in using these uh, biologically based and also data based tool uh, for their risk assessment. So the, these are well uh, two communities, but what we are um, advocating is for these two communities, two communities to come together, um, communicate with each other about regulatory uh, regulatory needs, uh, communicate that to the modelers. The modelers can develop tools to help um, support or refine better risk assessment. And um, so, this, this, um, I think this question also may, you may be asking: uh, Is there already a community um, on that? Um, the the one that uh, I know and several of us are involved with is this HESI PDPK committee. Um, so this is a committee that um, with a, um, a large group of PVK modelers, and uh, we often take on some of the common challenges and then do case studies. Um, so that, that is one of the PVK community that I am aware of. So maybe there are others that um, Alicia, you know, or Betty, Yonglu. I just had a comment that I think um, that the ideal situation is to have a PK a PBK modeler um, on your regulatory team. <laughs> so, um, and so um, I think Cecilia kind of fits that bill. So um, increasingly, we really need that expertise within regulatory agencies. And uh, certainly at Health Canada, we worked hand in hand with our, 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 you know, our PBK modelers uh, to uh, have models that were fit for purpose um, to um, ensure that uh, um, they were used um, uh, in appropriate context, et cetera. Um, and one of, the, one of the recommendations that has been made repeatedly, I think, in these documents is uh, that it would be really helpful to have a, um, a kind of a PBK community. Uh, for example, uh, for example, there's a committee in um, EPA 
a PBK, you know, committee that actually provides input to the various regulatory programs. And given that there's not, you know, that there's a kind of probably a shortage of expertise in PBK modeling internationally, it'd be really helpful to have this community advising regulatory agencies or that there was some kind of structure through one of the international agencies or others so that, that uh, uh, regulatory authorities could access, have continuing access to PBK expertise. Uh, Jean Lu, you have any comments on this? Maybe that you're always telling us that regulators is maybe not the right term. Maybe we are referring more to risk assessors. Well, yeah, the debate in regulators. Well, in you know, in our shoes as risk assessors, regulators will be the risk managers. So maybe we want to use the yeah, the term risk assessor. But coming back to Betty's comment. Uh, you know, the, a, PB, a PBPK community could be useful, but it could even be broadened to across uh, communities in terms of modeling. When we can think of, again about the ecotox area and maybe the use of in silico tools that we do use for the PBPK modeling, it could be even broadened to kind of in silico models for risk assessment purposes. Just a thought. Thank you, Jean Lu. Um, I will again ask this question maybe to all of you, but maybe uh, Cecilia, that uh, co author with me, the, the, the draft can answer uh, directly is about gender specific models. So, is it this addressed in the guidance and in any of the case studies? Um, or you want? It's not in the guidance, but Alicia, do you remember any case study that? No, no, I think none of them is really gender specific. Um, but uh, um, so there is, for instance, there, there are always representative uh, average population. Um, and but however, I feel that the guidance, it's uh, quite general and can be uh, applied uh, to different uh, uh, life stages uh, and different uh, genders. Uh, so also maybe uh, for pediatric uh, purposes, uh, uh, it could also be applied, although it's always, you know, uh, we're always thinking maybe for adults. Um, yes. <laughs> Any other comments for this? No. That's right. Um, okay. Yeah, I would think, uh... Pregnancy specific models, I mean, is gender specific. So, but the, so this template, the template, the template and evaluation would apply to. Yeah, exactly. So, in your case, now it's the uh, newest version, uh, sorry, newest uh, added case study uh, to the series of case studies that we published with the original guidance document. And uh, uh, indeed, you are. Uh, uh, looking at uh, um, uh, the pregnancy. So indeed, yes, it's more, you know, uh, targeted to a specific gender, you're right. Uh, but remain here, searching because I have a question for you. <laughs> um, many of the DNP in vitro activities are related for the brain development, but HTK offers only a very simple model for non-pregnant women. Is HTK still working on pregnancy model as announced a couple of years ago? Well, I mean, they, they have been working on the pregnancy model. The P, the actually the good news is the HTDK, the new version of release, just release a pregnancy model and uh, right around SOT. And so it's available now, but I haven't tested. But uh, yeah, so the pregnancy model is available uh, from HTDK now. So and I think it would be uh, valid, I mean, to compare whether um, a regular model and a, a, a practicing specific models on the predictions of the, basically the case study I'm using. So that's a very good point. Okay, and then one other technical question still for your case studies from uh, um, George Larizou. It's about uh, uh, if you have considered the, the free concentration instead of the nominal concentration in your uh, assessment, in your study design. So when you, uh, you apply, uh, when you were testing in vitro, usually you're giving to the cells your uh, a nominal concentration. 
but we know now that uh, um, uh, three concentration after this, the chemical is you know partitioning with plastic, uh, it's actually maybe a better dose metric. It's still some debate about this, but it's maybe uh, the best uh, uh, dose metric to use in this kind of approach uh, when you're extrapolating um, or when, you're, when you need to understand what is really the fraction uh, that can go to the cells. So do you know if uh, in your example, you have used the nominal concentration or the free concentration? Uh, is this question for me? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, for the example, I'm using the in vitro benchmark concentration, their nominal concentration, it hasn't been adjusted for, you know, the, the, the bandings, the plastic bandings, other components to derive the free concentration. But I mean, uh, I know like, uh, uh, there is a several mass balance models specifically on the in vitro assay system that uh, people are making effort to use these models to predict the, the possible free concentrations based on the nominal concentration. We haven't used that, but uh, there's the approaches we can use. Thank you. Uh, I'll go now back to uh, Betty. And uh, it's uh, a question uh, um, about, uh, again, goodness of fit. Um, when, uh, so when addressing the PBK model rel reliability for goodness of fit, we need in vivo data. How would you validate a model without any analogs chemical with validated PBK models? Is it a totally ab initio PBK modeling acceptable? Right, so <clears throat> we, um, I mean, it is, it is acceptable if the regulatory agency decrees that it's acceptable for their, for their purpose. Um, and so I think what we're, again, we don't have a lot of experience in that area currently uh, for you know, cases where we don't have in vivo data. So again, I think it's gonna be a case of uh, considering each, um, each model uh, case by case and then determining what's acceptable for the intended application. That will set precedent and there will be um, you know, additional experience will require additional experience in terms of getting a feel for what's acceptable for particular applications. I think um, at the moment, we, we just don't have a lot of that experience to kind of set precedent. So. Um, a question more about uh, the, the uh, guidance document. How, uh, sorry, who should uh, uh, complete the confidence metrics should this be a task of the modeler or the assessor? Maybe Cecilia can. Um, I think um, it would be more appropriate for the modeler to start, <laughs> right? Because uh, they're familiar with what they have done, all the justifications, assumptions that go into their model. So they are probably the best one to provide that information. And then going back to what we keep emphasizing again, this communication between the modelers and the users. If modelers can communicate with the users early on to um, explain the things that, um, the, the assumptions that they made, the type of data that they collected um, to increase that confidence, um, I, I think it, it, it will um, better facilitate on the acceptance of PBK model analysis. So um, I, I think that the overall strategy from the uh, guidance doc document is really that kind of, and as Cecilia said, the, the, the first part, the template would be kind of uh, filled out by the modeler, which is the one who knows what it has done. And it should be in an easy language, in a language uh, that should be you know, understandable by the risk assessor. And then I think the scoring should come from a third party. So it's either the risk assessor or somebody that has knowledge in kind of understanding uh, the modeling. Uh, and also the, 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 uh, the objective in which it has been developed. And finally, I think the scoring, the, the metric confidence final scoring should be done uh, by the, the, the risk assessor as well. So uh, he understands how good is the model and, and he's, he has trust in the model 
And so he can score whether it's a high or low. And I think if it's a low, he will ask the modeler to improve it. If it's high, he can use it. And if it's medium uh, or like it's, uh, he can decide whether it's something urgent to answer. So, okay, I can try to use this as a, as a first uh, piece of information. Or if you have time to reiterate and you know improve also the model in order to go to the lab to to to, to have a high high output of, of your of your credibility in your model, and and also in the document we really highlight that um, uh, if you are not really sure it can always be a kind of supportive information to your assessment. It doesn't need to be an actual value that you use you know for a point of departure. It can be you know informative. And then when you're really sure that you can use it, then it can, so you can have different layers. So, yes. And I don't know if anyone wants to. Yeah. Add can yeah. I, yeah. Can I add just briefly to that? Sure. I really think that that matrix is ultimately the responsibility of the, of the risk assessor, um, as you've indicated. But um, I do think that it would be, it's probably because they need to understand uh, the kind of comparative confidence they're looking for for their particular application. That's what's going to drive their consideration of high, moderate, and low. But on the other hand, it's a really good exercise for the modeler to walk through to try to characterize that. And then it, it, it actually kind of facilitates that discussion between them. And, and, and the objective is really to increase understanding on both sides of the model development and the model application. So. It, can I add something? I also echo the Cincinnati's point. I think uh, as a model army, it's it's probably easier for there to provide the uncertainty analysis uh, like firsthand. But I also think uh, the the modeler probably also like communicated with risk assessor on specific the what they were looking for and also understanding the the data that they're using. So. So it's best, basically you, you need to understand some biology behind all the, the modelings that could need some help from the risk assessors. Okay. Um, so another question is maybe more tailored to, to jean Lou uh, about novel ingredients. Uh, uh, so this uh, person is uh, interested to know if uh, um, you can, um, uh, whether a novel ingredient or a compound uh, uh, is possible, if exposome, for example, are possible to be used in modeling uh, when doing risk assessment. Maybe I got, yeah. Sorry, did you, did you say yeah. expo expo exposome? I think, or exosome. He wrote exosome, but I think it's, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Okay, well, I think for novel, when, yeah. in a way, basically, when you have the data on the kinetic parameters of your of your novel ingredients, potentially you could use the you could use the PVPK modeling to to, for example, derive a an at least a benchmark dose limit on an internal dose basis, and you could compare the in vivo study with maybe data on on in vitro studies and see if you can run a QIVV and compare the two. That's a possibility. Because by legislation, I think the in vivo data are still required. If we do that uh, for quite a few compounds, no matter what the you know the regulatory silo is, that would be also very useful. And that, that, that's joining the comment of Betty that this this could be a way to, to you know to get some more experience uh, in different regulatory contexts. Thank you. Thank uh, you. <laughs> I think. This yep. question and many of the other questions are not um, modeling specific. So um, we want to emphasize PVK models. They are th these are data based. So a lot of um, these concerns or issues are related to we don't have the data. If we have the data, like the gender specific, um, and then there are others that I I, I saw. Um, that, that, that are related more on the data side. If we have the data, we can put it in the model. But if we don't, the model cannot predict something that we don't know. Thank you, Cecilia, for this uh, um, comment. Um, 
um, I have. A, I will go for one of the last. Take one of the last uh, questions. Uh, um, all the others, I would like to uh, remind you that uh, if you haven't addressed them, we will try to get back to you by writing uh, after the in the next uh, days. Um, so, it's last question. Uh, I will take one, the one from uh, Jos Jos Bessens. Uh, how do you make sure the assessment information in the reporting template is one one link with the model? Uh, including its code, its input parameter, its implementation. And he thinks if a regulator or risk assessor wants to change some values like intake rate with a specific, within the specific model, is that actually would be a modification of the model? So will this hold still uh, the kind of uh, evaluation? So this is a question for all. I don't know who would like to start. Uh, yeah, I want to chip in. So for my cases, because I use an open source model, so actually all data, all code are ready available. I mean, I think when I submit this to the risk assessors, and if they, they for example, if there are another model are on the risk assessors team, so, and that probably help the communication if they, they want to, if, for example, if they not, satisfy the uncertainty assessment, they probably will talk to me, say, can you do more, can you provide more analysis on the uncertainty then? Uh, and also if they have a modeler on their team, I mean, they, the, 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 the code can be modified, that will be an improved model. So, I mean, that's the whole purpose. We would like to do the open source so everything can be validated. Yeah, I was going to just add in a bit there. I, you know, I think it's really helpful if you, if it's open source and if the if the risk assessor can actually replicate the results of the modeling and modify it to understand the impact um, that uh, you know of varying different parameters. Um, that's really critical to increasing understanding. I mean, I know it's not possible in all cases, but um, many regulatory agencies, regulatory programs like to um, have availability. Of the code for the models, so um, it helps acceptance. <laughs> Anyone else wants to? I I just want to ask. Uh, uh, maybe we should define what is like open source. Uh, probably open source means that uh, it's. Uh, what we mean by open source is that the code uh, it's available uh, for the uh, so the actual the mod the equation within the model are available to the risk assessor to be read. It can be uh, done in any type of language. Uh, R it's also free, and then we have for instance uh, Berkeley Madonna, which uh, you should pay a fee. Uh, so it's um, by open source we really mean that the the code has to be available available for the risk assessor, so that they can kind of play around, manipulate and evaluate and check that everything is structured in a proper way and also see if there are any errors, of course, as we just mentioned. So um, I think with this, I would like to uh, close uh, this webinar for today. I would really like to uh, thank uh, the participants for their active uh, uh, um, engagement and all this question. Thank uh, uh, Cecilia Tan, uh, Betty Meek, uh, Jean Ludorn, and Xiao Xin Chang for uh, their uh, presentations. And uh, yeah, if uh, you, the recording will be available. Uh, and also the question will, that was will not answered, we will try to address them in the next days, as I just said. And uh, I can give back the floor to Magda. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alicia. I mean, you did a, a great uh, job coordinating uh, uh, the the questions, uh, and uh, I guess there are no any other uh, final remarks from the panelists. Uh, so uh, I would like to take the opportunity first to thank all the participants uh, uh, for following us uh, the last uh, two hours and for submitting questions uh, and have the discussion uh, going. Uh, of course, an enormous thank uh, to our experts for presenting and uh, answering the, the questions today. Uh, hope you, you know, 
uh, uh, you enjoyed this uh, interactive uh, format. And uh, of course, special thanks to our uh, communication officer, Hannah Thabet, for helping us with uh, the preparation of the webinar and uh, also for taking care of uh, all the technicalities uh, today and helping us uh, to have this uh, uh, very smooth running uh, webinar. So thank you very much all. Thank you. Bye.